This is Polyamory Weekly, tales from the front of responsible non-monogamy from a pansexual, kink-friendly point of view. A warning for our under-18 listeners, this is an adult-oriented podcast about really lascivious things like communication and honesty in relationships. If you're under 18 and looking for upfront advice and answers to questions about sex, please visit scarletteen.com. This is Polyamory Weekly, episode 574, for June 2nd, 2019. Coming up on today's show, is it okay to ask to meet my metamor? That's coming up on today's show. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Polyamory Weekly. If you're a new listener, I'm your host, Minx, here with my co-host, Lusty Guy. Happy and lucky to be here, as always. Hello, everybody. And our only announcement for this week doesn't really have much to do with the podcast. It has to do with us. We are going to be taking our vacation in Denmark in July. So if you have anything that you want to suggest we should do or see while we're there, we're not overbooked. We're doing it kind of mellow. Copenhagen style, so let us know. Well, and I have read that Copenhagen itself, Copenhagen, excuse me, has an actual diving park with an obstacle course, underwater obstacle course. Oh, that sounds fun. So if there's any locals who want to take me out and show me the ropes of diving there, let me know. Send a message in. Can I'll bring my gear. I'm going to go anyway, right? But if there's a local there, it's probably better. That's lustyguy at polyweekly.com. We have a pretty exciting Polly in the News story that came out just yesterday. So huzzah to me for waiting to the last minute to record the podcast. Boom. Because. That's timely. Yeah. This is about the estimated number of non-monogamous people in the U.S. I am asked this on a fairly regular basis, and it's always difficult to say because it's not a question that's on the census. Canada had some good stats for a while, but... We've got some pretty good stats now based on some articles and studies that have come out recently, including using two separate samples based on the U.S. Census, Hopert and colleagues found that fully one-fifth of the population in the United States, 21.9% in the first sample and 212 in the second, has engaged in consensual non-monogamy at some point in their lives. So this is not people who self-identify as non-monogamous or poly or relationship anarchist or swinger, but who have said that they have done this consensually at some point in their lives. Or that they can somehow squint at the census data. And I'm really curious about that. It's based on U.S. census data. What? How do you get there from U.S. census data? I don't know, but it's okay. Go on. That is true. So, it. I mean, it's pretty interesting. This means one in five. You look at five people and one of them has probably tried consensual non-monogamy in some point in their lives. That's pretty cool. Well, and the other thing about that is that this is in the last year or so, the third or fourth, I don't remember, one of the numbers, um, strikes at this particular question. And they're all coming back in the same kind of range. Just, mm-hmm. you That's know, true. a half point, point off, something right in there. And this is in line with some of the other numbers that we've seen coming out of Canada and some other exactly. countries and some other studies that were... In, you, you don't know how much you can trust the data. You have to look at the methodology. But this is in line with some of the other studies we've heard about. Now, so that's the number of people that have tried consensual non-monogamy at some point. That's different from people who self-identify as some type of consensually non-monogamous. But Rubin and colleagues found that 4 to 5% of the population of the United States was currently involved in a consensual non-monogamous relationship. Uh, We go on. Ryan Witherspoon, go ahead. I was going to say, that seems about right to me. Yeah. I mean, just, you know, when I think about my experience and wandering around and meeting people, yeah, that I wouldn't be at all surprised for that to be accurate. Yep. And there's another study that says 4% of relationships are open slash non-monogamous in some way which matches the percentage found in a representative Canadian sample. Multiple representative studies have found that approximately one in five adults report prior engagement in a consensually non-monogamous relationship. All the citations are in this article, which we'll provide a link to in the show notes. But basically, 
These are some pretty impressive numbers. They really are. They really are. It's, it's, well, it's kind of flabbergasting, really. Well, when you keep in mind that those numbers are roughly equivalent to the number of people that identify as GLBTQIA, which is, uh, I, I double checked because I didn't quite believe what was reported, but uh, a 2018 article said 4.5% of Americans identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. And the reason that number is high is that 8.2% of millennials identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. Which, again, makes sense. Totally makes sense. So we are right up there. Yeah, it's amazing. It really is. I like that NCM. We're going to think it's a little... CNM. Thank you. CNM. Consensual non-monogamy. Some quick, spicy little... I don't know. CNM. What does that say? It's got to be... Conum. No. (laughs) All right. Keep working on it. I'm not going to work on that. I'll just call it CNM. In our topic this week, quick summary of our letter writer who asked to be identified as Soft Shell Crabby, which I think is super cute. She is 43 and her boyfriend 42. They've been together for four years and they did Don't Ask, Don't Tell for a long time. And and they would have sex with other people, come back and not talk about it, basically. And they realized they were getting more and more intimate and much closer over the years. So after a while, he came out to her as Polly and said that he didn't tell her before because, quote, felt it was easier to hide and avoid the tough conversations. Always a good sign. But through this, they agreed to be open and honest about their partners, their needs, and to communicate everything. Well, here's the sticking point that Softshell Krabby writes in. She says he has a girlfriend from New York that he met a couple years ago and before her own relationship with him became deeper and before that conversation about having open and honest communication. So now the girlfriend's coming to town. He had already arranged some sexy times with her and another partner. So now Softshell Krabby is feeling kind of left out. She says she feels hurt, betrayed, and somewhat disrespected. She also throws in that she's not really okay with the girlfriend using her boyfriend to cheat on her husband. That the girlfriend using Softshell Krabby's boyfriend to cheat on the girlfriend's husband, which Softshell Krabby finds unethical. And she basically wants to at least be able to meet this girlfriend, which was, had not previously been agreed to. So she writes, My unspoken thoughts that I haven't yet shared are that all I really want is for him to explain to this woman that our relationship has developed a much to a much deeper level since they originally made their plans together. And in light of that new development, he would like to amend their plans to involve meeting me. Is that a reasonable statement? Am I being unreasonable by wanting him to prioritize differently now that there are no more secrets between us? This situation makes me feel like he's getting to call all the shots, make the rules, and conduct himself however he pleases without regards to my feelings. He says I'm the most important person in his life and that he loves me, but to me, his actions make him appear like he's the only person he's concerned with making happy. I know that the only person that I can control is me, and I can't expect others to behave as I would or treat me as I would treat them. I still find myself asking, how do I reconcile all of the feelings I've connected to this woman and her mysterious visit? How do I move past this and find a resolution everyone's happy with? And how do I forgive my man for conducting himself in an unethical manner? I want to offer my best self and practice polyamory in a way where I am setting a good example. I know you'll give it to me straight. Help, please. Dun, dun, dun. Yes. Where do we start? There's a lot of start there, huh? There's, yeah, there's some things to unpack there. Well, so first of all, thank you for writing in and right. for sharing this with us. And, you know, the standard, look, however you feel is okay. Don't spend any time beating yourself up about how you feel and is it reasonable? Is it unreasonable? Is it right? Is it wrong? It just is. Yep. Whatever you feel is reasonable for you. Now, having said that, they gets a little, a little stickier. Let's say, first of all, that this situation isn't really about who gets to call the shots. And you phrasing it that way suggests to me that there might be some issues of just hurt feelings and um, 
competition involved here. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's okay. Again, we all have hurt feelings, and we'll talk about how to address that in a second or two here. But this isn't about who gets to call the shots, because who gets to call the shots is known. You get to call your shots, and he gets to call his shots. Yep. And she, the metamorph, gets to call her shots. Exactly. So... Is it unreasonable for you to tell him to tell her the statement that you put out there? Well, there's two answers to that. At a meta level, yes. It is always unreasonable to try to have conversations with people through people. To tell him, go tell her this, and then see what she says and tell me what she said. Yeah, 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 yeah that's crazy making. No, that is inherently unreasonable. It's not unreasonable to want that. And to ask him for what you want. Exactly. On a different level. Now, telling him what to do, no. But saying how you feel and why you think you feel that way and what would make you feel better, asking for that, yeah, yeah. that's fine. So if you feel like you want to meet her, it's perfectly reasonable. Even if it's not reasonable to feel that way, but you still do, it's perfectly reasonable to say, I would like to meet her. The catch is, the answer may be no. Yes. And you have to be ready to accept that. She may say no. She's got every bit as much right to consent in this little ethical system as everybody else. She can't be compelled to meet somebody she doesn't want to meet, for whatever reasons, reasonable or not, that she has. And likewise, your boyfriend can't be compelled to introduce you if he doesn't want to. Everybody has an equal right in that little exchange of consent. So, yeah, you can say, I would like to meet her. But then other people can say no, and you got to be able to live with that. And you can also start to think about things that would make you feel not, what were the words you used, hurt, disrespected. So let's say this situation progresses as it was originally planned. What other things could you ask your partner for that would help you not to feel that way anymore? Exactly. So for example, if it's true that what really is bothering you is that you would like some group sex yourself, well, maybe you could ask for your partner to set some of that up. Maybe that would be good. Find something. I'm not saying that's what's going on, by the way. Maybe you want to be treasured. Maybe you want something else. Find something else that is within your power, the power of your partner and their purview and their consent zone can give you to help make you feel better and ask for that. The Gracie gift. Now, that being said, there are a couple issues here that are near and dear to my heart. I just want to address and sort of express my own personal thoughts on, not necessarily advice, but personal thoughts. You mentioned the ethical issue of cheating, that he is with a woman who is cheating on her husband. Okay, so you now know that those are your ethics, but guess what? Your partner gets to have his ethics, and the woman that he's with gets to have her ethics. Now, I personally decided a long time ago that I wasn't going to do that. If one of my partners is with someone else who is cheating, then I can't be with that partner. Now, there are a lot of reasons for that. Some of it has to do with ethics. Some of it has to do with just the practicality of things for me. But this is where you get to decide, is this a hard limit for you? Is this something that you're willing to, if that continues, that you walk away from this relationship because you feel that in good conscience, you can't be a part of it? Because remember, you can't ask someone else to do anything, but you can decide if that model of relationship works for you. And then you always have the option to leave. Absolutely. Now on that topic, I want to throw in here, the way that you phrased this was, how do I forgive my man for conducting himself in an unethical manner? So forgiveness is a gift we give ourselves. You forgive him by understanding it's not your role to be his ethical enforcer. I doubt very highly you're sitting on his shoulder like a little Jiminy Cricket telling him what's right and wrong every day of every moment. He's got his own ethical system and has to be responsible for it. You forgive him by understanding that if you carry around that nub of anger and resentment, you're harming yourself, and you're carrying a burden that you don't have to carry. Now, having said that, I do want to underscore one of Minx's ideas just a moment ago about ethics. When you phrase it, how do I forgive my man for conducting himself in an unethical manner, you are what's the term? Imposing your ethics on someone else? Well, that's not, yes, but it's not the idea that I'm going for. Uh, let me tell you the idea I'm going for. 
How do I forgive my man for being unethical? You see the difference in that phrasing? You are putting a level of distance and disassociation and passive voice with these actions. We are be our behavior. All of us behave unethically sometimes. But what you have here is somebody who wasn't telling you what was going on originally in, in your relationship and is now doing something you regard as unethical. There's a pattern developing that I'm seeing here. And you need to open your eyes and look at that clearly. Am I telling you he's unethical? We all are. So yeah, I am. I'm also telling you that you need to look at it straight and see if, in light of that, you're still happy to be there. Don't hide from it. Don't try to make it something that it's not. It's not your responsibility. It still is what it is and is happening. And the other point I wanted to talk about was this question outside of this situation of, wanting to meet and talk to your metamors. And Lusty Guy and I say this all the time, that for us, it generally tends to work best, your mileage may vary, if our metamors can at the very least communicate with each other in an emergency situation. Like we need to at the very least have phone numbers and email and some type of line of communication open in the instance that somebody has to go to the hospital and your partner's unconscious, we really want your, you know, your metamor to be able to call you and, and to say what's going on. Now, you may decide that your level of metamor contact is higher or lower than that. I figured out a long time ago that I really need to be able to talk to my metamors. If there is a metamor that is not willing to talk to me, then I generally just can't be in that relationship. I can't be with that partner because I personally need it for a variety of reasons. It helps me feel more comfortable. Um, it works best for me. It goes with my ethics. I mean, there are a lot of reasons, but you need to figure out what works best for you. I mean, outside of this situation, if it were somebody else, if this is something that is a hard limit for you, that you need to be able to talk to your metamors, you need to be able to meet your metamors, well, then again, you have a decision to make. You always have the option of leaving this relationship and, and starting another poly relationship where this is one of the things that you can insist upon. Absolutely. You do you. And even if the solution is not that you leave this relationship, even if it's that you tell your partner, look, I'm going to need to be able to do this in the future. You need to tell your future partners that that's a proviso. And if you're not going to work with me and do that, then I will leave or whatever. Figure out what works best for you. The last idea that I want to leave you with is this notion. And I might just be seeing this because it's something I've been working on in myself quite a bit recently, mm -hmm. but that's how we all are. Your comments about cheaters. There's a couple of places that you wrote in there about cheaters that made me think of this. More compassion, less judgment. Everybody screws up sometimes. Most monogamous relationships will involve cheating. And I am finding myself really trying to understand and be compassionate of people when they do things that I think are stupid, rather than just thinking they're stupid. For example, somebody who cheats probably isn't happy. There's probably something going on in that relationship, or maybe that's a myth we all buy into, but it's my stab at trying to be compassionate. So I would encourage you, try to be compassionate to this metamor more than judging them for the cheating. It's true. Many people have written in and told me that they found their way to polyamory through cheating because they felt in the past that cheating was the only way that they could be true to their non-monogamous selves. And they were trying to be compatible. They were trying to be their best self. Maybe it wasn't the best choice, but that helped me to find a little bit more compassion for cheaters. It's really easy to strike people down for cheating. But the truth is, society generally forces monogamy down our throats, and a lot of people feel like they don't have the choice. So, agreed. More compassion, less judgment. Yeah. But again, however you feel is okay. You get to ask for what you want, reasonable or not. And you have some thinking to do. It's time for your happy poly moment of the week, brought to you by Fubbly Polyamorists Everywhere. Our happy poly moment for this week comes from Johnny, who writes, I wanted to share with you that I just started and I'm very new to poly. My girlfriend's... L, birthday, is coming up, and my wife, R, and myself picked out her gift together, which Aww. is awesome, but it gets better. 
Elle's husband, Kay, knows I am new to Polly, and even though he is going through feels, asked Elle to check in with me to make sure I didn't need anything for our first big Polly meeting birthday. I am so happy that I am being included in their Polly family, and I'm excited for the journey we are all taking together. Thank you for all your guidance and advice. Your podcast has helped me to have the courage to keep going. Aww. Aww. I know. That's the thing. These small gestures that people can make towards their metamors can make a big difference. Absolutely. And Johnny, in as much as you can continue looking for those gestures and appreciating them when you get them, you'll get more of them. And we have feedback on episode 573, and I knew we were going to get... Yeah, you cringed when this happened. I knew that we were going to get feedback on using this term, nerd blackface, with respect to the Big Bang Theory. So our feedback letter is from Jessica, who said, During this episode, there was the term nerd blackface that was used several times. The logic expressed being that the show... Uh, which was Big Bang Theory, is a caricature of nerd culture in order to appeal to a mass market. This is an inaccurate and problematic use of the term blackface. Blackface and minstrelsy is an expression of white supremacy and has been used to further the oppression of black people. It isn't just that it mocked black people by making them into caricatures, but that it was used to portray black people as brutish and to justify violence against them. For example, D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation. Blackface is about reducing people to the color of their skin. Conversely, a show that centers and normalizes a subculture, even while using caricature in order to further the situational comedy format, is not putting on nerd culture in any way that can be compared to blackface. In The Big Bang Theory, the nerds are the protagonists. Further, the show has brought on recurring characters who are legitimate nerds. Mayim Bialik has a PhD in neuroscience. I suspect a number of the writers and actors have legit nerd cred. Please do better, Jessica. All right, Jessica. So first of all, let me say thank you very much for writing in. It's really always nice when our listeners can write to correct us and say things. Um, And as I understand your letter, you have basically two levels of complaint with the use of the term in that context. The first is that nerds ain't black folk. And by taking this term blackface, which very specifically applies to actions that were taken in regards to the black community in American history and in that context, and applying it to nerds, you devalue the term and misunderstand the horrible nature of what really happened to black folk in America. And at that level of analysis, you know, all I got to do is tip my hat to you. You're right. Yeah. Yeah, I see exactly what you're saying, and I tip my hat. The second, and thanks again for saying The second layer of analysis you seem to be saying is that, uh, and that I'm hearing, is that the term just simply doesn't apply. The meaning behind the term, I'm going to use the term uh, to mean caricaturing a subgroup for the entertainment of the majority. Uh, That's what I'm trying to talk about um, beyond blackface. When I say the term, that's what I mean. You seem to be saying the term or the idea doesn't apply to the show uh, the Big Bang Theory. Now, I'm going to respond to that in two ways. One, I don't watch the show. I really can't fall on my sword, get involved in a big hill that I'm going to fight and die for on that question. Because I don't, I'm not going to bother. I'm not going to get the primary data. I will say this. I am personal friends with a lot of people that identify as nerds. And I'm aware of a lot of online controversy from people who identify nerds who do use that term to mean that idea and react negatively to that show, saying that to them, it feels like a caricature of their culture and their experience of their culture. So I'm not going to sit here and tell you the show is or isn't that. I am going to say there's a lot of people that I would not dismiss their experience of it in quite that way. And that's a level of defense um, of the show that eh, I don't think it applies So on the first concept, you're right. Nerds ain't black folk. Thank you very much for pointing it out. Could leave it there, but I got to say on the second one, simply because there are so many nerds out there who think the concept does apply, I'm not going to dismiss them. I I see their point too. Agreed. I do. 
Um, I do watch the show. I have had conversations about it with many nerds, which I'm not sure I qualify as a nerd or not. I don't think so. Um, but most of the conversations I have had is that the show doesn't normalize the subculture. It mocks it. And that we are supposed to sympathize with Penny, who is the quote unquote normal one, not the nerds. She is the protagonist and everybody else there is basically there to be laughed at. And that is a complaint I have heard, which is why I did feel comfortable repeating the use of that term. But we really appreciate when you write in to us and keep us honest in this respect. And we'd like to welcome Camilla. Thank you for joining as our newest Polly Weekly Playmate. Welcome. And I'd like to thank Camilla and all our other Polly Weekly Playmates who subscribe to help keep Polly Weekly going. We are a free resource. We've helped hundreds of thousands of people navigate their introduction to and continue success with polyamory. If you have questions or comments or feedback, please call 802-505-POLY. You can write in to polyweekly at gmail.com. If you'd like to book us for something, have us teach a class, come speak at your event, email lustyguy at polyweekly.com. And you can find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash polyweekly, on Twitter at polyweekly or at cunningminx and elsewhere on the internet with those IDs. Well, I think that about wraps it up for today's show. Everybody say goodbye to Lusty Guy, who is leaving the country, and me and L for a month. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> yeah. And remember, it's, it's not, not all about, about the sex. sex.